My name is Mervi Janssen. I'm the CEO of Omni Education Partnerships from Finland. And I'd like to warmly welcome our on-site and oh, online can. audience to our panel yeah. on the role of assessment and certification in building more resilient and equitable futures. Um, I have to say that when I'm, you know, every time I'm speaking about assessment, um, an incident comes to my mind. My daughter, Hannah, was in the fourth grade and she came home and she was extremely upset that day. And I asked her what happened at school. And she told me that um, there was an exam and the teacher had asked all the wrong questions. So she had actually crossed out some questions, written her own and answered her own questions then. And um, I was a bit afraid of when they received the exam back to see what the results were. But um, her teacher was very broad and open-minded and actually had um, given her a good score and written that she had been extremely creative and her answers to her questions were excellent. Um, unfortunately, that's not always the case in life. So we're here today to talk about what assessment really is, what's it for, what role technology might play, and of course, what the future of assessment should look like. I have two panelists here with me. We would have had an online person as well, but unfortunately the streaming doesn't work. So we will do um, all that we can to answer all of your questions and think out of the box what the future of assessment might look like. But um, I'll turn to my panelists now, and I'd like to ask you to introduce yourself and make an opening statement. How do you feel about assessment? What is equitable assessment? Um, sally Ann, would you like to start? Absolutely. Hello, everyone. It's such a pleasure to have you um, here today and to be here with all of you. Um, so I have a story like yours. <laughs> I failed the exam. Uh, at nine years old in my home country, Trinidad and Tobago, that gets you into um, uh, uh, the right middle school that determines your entire future. But I just had parents who were able to have connections to get me into school. And that's not okay. So I think my statement um, about assessments um, is going to be we have to, if we're going to flatten the diversity and inclusion for every brilliant young person or every brilliant older person, because we all are, we have to completely rethink assessment um, as it stands right now. I totally agree with you. What about Raya, please? So for me, assessment is a really emotional topic. Um, like many students, when I was in high school, I felt like my exams never measured what I was truly good at. I failed a lot of exams uh, as well. I hated studying for exams, but I loved learning. And I felt like there was this huge mismatch between the process of learning, process of developing your skills, and taking an exam. And I think that the way we assess students today is actually inhumane. So I hope to offer some exciting, more humane alternatives for the future of education. Wonderful. Let's ask our audience at this point. Um, please raise your hand if you feel that you've always received a fair assessment, a grade or a score that you feel truly represents your knowledge, skills and competence. Do we have anybody who feels that way about assessments? No. I think that's very sad, actually. And I think it really shows that we need to do something drastically different. Of course, the question is now, what about COVID-19? Has that actually changed anything? Um, I mean, if we look at education as a landscape, it's not something that's associated with rapid change. And although we have new technology and we have different approaches we could take, is that really happening? Are we measuring the right things the right way and for the right reasons? And if, if not, what should we do differently? So my question is, have we got the what and how, first of all, right? And how should we transform it? sally -Ann, would you like to start? Sure. Um, so I'm in the human skills space. Um, and I think, and human skills, I mean that spectrum of 
creative thinking, critical thinking, entrepreneurship, judgment and decision making, leadership. Um, and those are the things that interestingly make up about 85% of job success. And what has happened, um, I remember for years, I don't know if I can say this, but I remember for years talking about this all the time and people were like, why is she so excited about this stuff? You know, and what is she smoking? That she's so excited about this stuff. And all of a sudden COVID happened and COVID happened. And everyone's like, ah, that's what you have been excited about. So I think with all the negativity of COVID, um, certainly in the space that I am in, um, it has really brought it to the front burner that a huge part of who we are and, you know, the big determination in the future of work is going to be what gets automated and what remains with humans. I think the assessment of the space that I'm in, human skills, actually now is a, an actual topic of conversation. It was not. It was not before. So I think if you look at SEL in the US curriculum, a social and emotional learning. Um, I think if you look at a lot of the cohort based learning happening in the adult um, space, um, a lot of the collective wisdom uh, industry experts, just look at Clubhouse. Clubhouse is an example of all of the things that's happening in the space. So, um, you know, to, to, you know, go back to answering specifically your question, we are in the Renaissance of uh, the, what is happening in this assessment. And I think the things we were talking about for 20 or 30 years, it's just happening right now um, in a span of two years uh, and very quickly. We're talking about soft skills. We're saying they're important, but are we still assessing the knowledge component? Has anything really changed? It has. It has. So you cannot assess soft skills by a certificate because that's static. Uh, so a certificate in leadership um, does not mean you know how to practice leadership. So one of the things we do at Gleek, which is, you know, my startup, is we look at you applying leadership in the context of others. And it's fluid, like a FICO credit score. So it's something that I see you continuously doing, and I'm giving you the ability to signal that to employers with deep links and for jobs to find you based on those skills. So those things are happening now. Um, so the traditional assessment of soft skills, um, you know, and with huge respect to, you know, a lot of the universities uh, that offer the traditional static assessment and credentialing of it, um, I don't think that's viable anymore. I think a lot of these very transparent fluid ways in the context of collective wisdom and of others um, is where assessment of human skills and soft skills is happening. Mm. And we'll see a, a much more of that happening. Yeah. What do you think, Roy? I mean, we still have the high stakes exams. Is that wrong? Should we abolish that? I mean, basically, where should we go with assessment? Yes. Yeah. So I think one of the okay, most exciting you. things well, that well, happened during COVID is that the board examinations got cancelled uh, for two go years in a row. And for better or worse, what that allowed us to do as a society is try to imagine a world without those board examinations. So Universities were forced to try to reimagine the admission systems without those examinations. And you know what? Everything worked out just fine. Now, I think it's worth spending some time for those of us who are still pro-traditional assessment, spending some time I'm pinpointing have, what's wrong with traditional you know, assessments. So some of the main issues but with traditional assessments is that A, it's mostly summative. We rely on one or two major exams at the end of the year in order to evaluate a student's worth. It's also usually paper-based, right? It's based, it's closed book and paper-based, which forces learners to focus more on memorizing information rather than developing their skills. It also uh, measures a very narrow type of intelligence. So we're really focused on, again, memorization with some logical analytical uh, intelligence for the creatives, for the, uh, you know, for, for the systems thinkers, for the solutionaries, 
there isn't th those assessments don't really serve them well. So those are some of the issues we have with the traditional kind of board examinations. Now, I think what we need instead is completely, to be honest, obliterate those and go back to the drawing skills, board and try to reimagine uh, assessment for today's be, world. And I think the alternatives that uh, we're working on at School of Humanity, uh, which is the organization I work on, and we're seeing other future focused schools work on is so more project based assessments more micro-assessments, where you can uh, gradually earn micro-credentials throughout your schooling, throughout your university, rather than have that one exam, and also more peer-to-peer -peer assessments, more self-evaluations, uh, rather than one examiner determining your worth for the rest of your life. So those are some of the characteristics of new types of assessments that I think we need to see um, in today's world. We've actually done a total reform in Finland in the vocational education and training sector. And there um, we have modules, and each module has a certain set of learning outcomes and competences that you are to demonstrate. And the demonstration is actually hands on. So it's not about knowledge as such, but very much about applied knowledge. And there have been some interesting um, new things coming up for that as well. We are now looking at virtual reality and artificial intelligence so that we take certain situations into virtual reality where we can test or assess them safely and in a more authentic environment. So, I mean, AI, for instance, instead of a teacher, what say you? Is that something that we're going to be looking at in the future? What are the pros and cons of something like that? sally -Ann, what do you think? Sure. So we use um, AI at Gleek, uh, machine learning, um, and we use it in different ways. So uh, we use collective wisdom, and collective wisdom we use um, where we use it to benchmark AI. So AI requires a benchmark um, as a starting point. Um, so we use what would an industry expert, how would they apply this particular skill in this situation? Um, and then we tag off of that and we learn on of, off of that. And that's where our machine learning ha uses as a baseline to then really kind of accurately start, you know, there is, there is knowledge everywhere and we miss it. So AI just allows us to expedite finding that knowledge everywhere. So I, th I think you never lose the human element. The human element, certainly, in, as I said, in my space, um, human skills. Um, uh, but what the AI does, it allows us very, very quickly to, to find patterns. You know, critical thinking looks this way in applying skills. And, you know, we do caselets. Um, and also a lot of VR. So a lot of our learning actually gets made into storyboards for VR. Um, uh, it looks differently in India than it would look in Finland, that it would look in somewhere else. And oh, wow, when we find these types of behaviors in individuals, they tend to be at the top spectrum of Bloom's taxonomy. You know, they're in the create and the analyze versus. So there are all kinds of things um, that, so I don't think it's an either or conversation. It's an and conversation. And I think very often we make it an either or conversation and it should not be. I couldn't agree with you more. Um, I was told that now the streaming is working so that we have Hanan with us. Is she here? Maybe she, oh, there she is. Yes, hi Hanan, it's good to see you. Hello um, Would you like to introduce yourself and share some insights about assessment and innovation in assessment? Okay, we can't hear her. Um, unfortunately, we can't hear our speaker she can hear she us she can hear us but we, but can't, we can't hear, hear her you. That's okay. i'm Let's so keep. sorry i'm so sorry yeah um Raya, would you like to share insights about innovation and basically we've talked about ai and the fact that it's complementary, so it's not going to make, let's say, all the teachers disappear. We will still need that human touch and interaction because that's a part of the assessment. But um, what other innovations would you like to uh, share with us? Yeah, so I think that um, 
one of my frustrations, particularly with ed tech, is that a lot of investors in the space, a lot of you know, a, a lot of uh, even governments in the space, when they think about innovation, they focus on technology. And there's a lot of amazing innovation in technology, and you know, uh, there's lots of AI and machine learning and even digitization happening, which is amazing. But we don't spend enough time talking about innovation in curriculum, innovation in education policy, innovation in pedagogy, innovation in you know even the way we imagine learning and the way we organize learning. So one of the uh, approaches we took at School of Humanity, so we set out to create a new type of high school for the world. And the kind of exercise that we followed was, imagine you erased the existing school system. You took away all of the assumptions, you took away all of the constraints, and you had to create it again from scratch. You had to create a new type of school system for today's world. What would it look like, right? And what kind of curriculum would you design? Would you organize students into grade levels? Would you even have exams? Would you even have a school, right? So that's the kind of thinking behind reimagining the education system that I think about when I think about innovation. So with that in mind, there's a couple of nice pedagogical innovation that we're seeing around the world. One is this rise of the mastery-based model, where instead of organizing, um, whether it's in university or uh, high schools, students by age, by year groups, you allow them to progress through the curriculum by mastery. So it's much more fluid. You don't set time bound levels. That's a really exciting innovation and many schools around the world are starting to adopt the mastery model. Another example of innovation complementing that is the mastery transcript, which is essentially a new type of report card where instead of reducing students down into single letter grades uh, of subjects, you show transferable skills that the student has mastered, which is evidenced by a portfolio of projects. And that's a completely novel way of transcripting and showcasing. And it's a much more holistic way of showcasing a learner's accomplishment. So those are just some of the few innovations, particularly in pedagogy and learning model, that really excite me. Thank you. Um, then there's, of course, the question about what is really assessment for the real world? Like you mentioned, the project, uh, uh, that's a lot richer as an approach in showing somebody's real competence to apply the knowledge in different situations. But um, basically, if we look at um, who we assess for, of course, as you said, it should be for the learner. So it should be a learning experience, and you should be able to reflect on this. Am I what is expected of me, or can I improve somewhere? We always know that there's room for improvement. But then, of course, if we're looking at it from basically the world of work, um, we heard from PWC in the plenary that it's about soft skills, it's about digital skills, it's about your mindset, the fact that you're able to you know, perform in a given situation. Of course, if we look at what's happening in the world, a greener mindset is something that we should be able to assess. But of course, then the other side of the coin is the fact that we want to be able to be scalable, fast, transparent, all this. So it's not an easy equation. And of course, if we want to, you know, take the easy route, it's going to be tick the box type of an assessment. But that doesn't really tell us a lot. So from an employer's point of view, the fact that somebody gets a score of 450 versus 480 or 520, what does that really tell you? Um, what do you think, sally -Ann? I mean, so I think, you know, assessments, I found it interesting that you said it's for the learner to be able to understand where they stand. I think many of the assessments is really a signaling for the next step of, it's actually not for the learner. Mm. Um, I think most assessments are set up to, okay, the university has an indicator to accept you now that you've come out of high school, or an employer has an indicator that you're employable, and clearly that has not been the right signal. Um, so from a, I, I mean, and let's think about what's happening in the world right now. Employers are creating their own, look at AWS, look at IBM, look at all the companies. They actually are not giving credit, most of them anymore, to the traditional assessments. And they are creating, they, I think companies have become the, the fourth educator um, because they are just not getting the assessments and the signals traditional educators are sending out is not representative of readiness for anything. 
So they have created their own almost like onboarding into the company. Let me put you through my class and my, you know, and I, you know, and I will throw that, you know, kind of thought out there. Would you accept someone with a degree from a university for a particular job, let's say in tech, let's say cybersecurity, uh, the, one of the hottest job in the U.S. right now. Would you accept someone for that job coming out with a traditional university degree or if you actually saw they had certifications from IBM, AWS, you know, all the big employers out there, who do you think is going to get the job? The traditional university uh, a degreed student or the one who has the assessments and signaling from corporates? Right? So I think... I think that answers in an indirect way that the question employers have just decided to become the fourth educator. Mm -hmm. Can there be a middle ground? I mean, could we get the educational sector and the employers to work more, more together? Would that be, you know, a way out, um, a way to address some of these challenges that, let's say, the world of work doesn't always even respect what education is doing and education does not know enough about the changes, the rapid changes taking place so that when you graduate, at the end of the day, what's the value of your qualification regardless of your marks. So I think we really need to look at assessment and certification also from the point of view of what is valid. What do you think, Raya? I completely agree. I think uh, government policy also plays a huge role in synchronizing that collaboration between industry and the private sector. One of the biggest challenges that schools and universities face in reimagining accreditation, uh, reimagining assessments, and consequently credentialing and accreditation is the fact that most governments don't recognize and attest alternative transcripts. Mm -hmm. So in a lot of uh, countries, including this one, actually, uh, in order, let's say you want to create a new type of curriculum, you want to create a new type of assessment, and you want your students to graduate um, from high school and have those alternative assessments be recognized, it's actually a huge challenge and most governments don't attest that and recognize that. So it creates this mismatch between organizations that want to reimagine or schools that want to reimagine this and, and private sector that wants to hire students or learners from those backgrounds. Um, so I think the best educational organizations collaborate very closely with the private sector, with the workforce, to make sure their curriculum is designed for that. But none of that is possible if it's not recognized by the local governments. Sure. Um, Can I add to that? Yeah. Um, Go ahead. I, I would say it depends on where you are in the world. Because if you look right now at what's happening in the US, so if I look at Guild Education, Guild Education is a marketplace for universities. And basically, what they have done, um, and this is where Walmart is offering all of their employees uh, education that you know they have paid for, and they have a say in the curation of that curriculum. So I think what we've always seen private sector lead innovation, right? I mean, that's just historically. It's if we leave it to government, it's not going to happen very quickly, probably except for the UAE, um, that we're exceptional. Um, uh, I do have to say, but. If we look at Guild Education, what they've done is they've literally taken all the universities, the majority of them, they have, they're having problems, university now, in getting students um, uh, across the board, and they have created a marketplace and really have sat with them, and you have now labor analytics companies like MZ Burning Glass that can take any university's curriculum, and they can crunch using AI and actually tell you if that curriculum aligns to job families, job roles, gaps in the marketplace, and educators very easily now, they don't have to do it on their own, they can actually now very quickly realign curriculum to the actual marketplace, and then you have the intermediary, like Guild, that is working with all the big corporates to create that bridge between traditional university um, and the corporates, right? And then the other extreme is you have the AWSs, the IBMs who have just gone out and said, I'm not even gonna do that. I'm just gonna create my own yeah. curriculum. Um, so I think it's happening. It's happening right now in the US. Yeah. And I have to say that it's happening in Finland, like I said, on the vocational level. Mm -hmm. Basically what we've done there is it, because it's learning outcomes based, it doesn't matter 
where that learning happened. Mm -hmm. So we're only assessing the outcomes. And like I said, that's basically something that's extremely flexible. So basically, you could have gone to school, you could have worked for 10 years, it doesn't really matter. It's all recognized. So recognition of prior learning towards actual accreditation, that's basically something that we have in the reformed law. So everybody's obliged to do that, mm -hmm. but that's still rather new. So there are still a lot of very traditional systems that don't recognize if it's from a different path. And I think that's perhaps one of the obstacles um, what, do you, what do you think? I mean, what should we do? How do we push more and more into the flexibility? So Western Governors University is right now the fastest, one of the fastest growing universities in the world, and it's a competency-based university. And that's an example of how do we give people different on-ramps so you don't have to come on in one spot out of high school into university. How do I give you different on and off-ramps? Um, uh, to signal that you have competency. Mm -hmm. um, because you can have, on a piece of paper, you have a skill, but it's really how do you demonstrate that you have competency? And there is nothing like experience, right? Yeah. There is absolutely, you know, that's one of the things that we do at Gleek. You know, one of our big measures and assessment at Gleek is your quality of application to industry experts within the domain and outside the domain, and people go, well, why? And I said, well, you know what? I can have someone from a third tier city who has never had formal education uh, performing in critical thinking and creative thinking at the level of a Nobel Peace Prize laureate or a CEO, <laughs> but how do you ever show that in traditional education through assessment and sing you can't, but I can you know, in the way that we have kind of decided to show assessment and signaling. So it is happening. Um, I think all of these things are happening, maybe um, not as fast enough, but I certainly think, you know, I think a lot of times you're correct, either it's in Finland or the US that kind of leads a lot of, you know, uh, 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 they're kind of the outliers, certainly in the startup space. I mean, look mm -hmm. at the work Raya is doing. Um, uh, I think the startup space is where you're seeing so much of the innovation happening. And I think if traditional universities are smart, they would start bringing in the startups as their R&D. Um, so recently you had Minerva University um, do tie-ups with Zayed University here in the region. They did tie-ups with University of Miami. And that's an example of challenger type of universities that if you're smart, you know, you don't need to reinvent the wheel and figure it out. You know, look at the startups out there and what they're doing and bring them in to collaborate. And I think that's the fastest way to be able to allow that to happen. If I can add to that, sure. um, there's a beautiful quote from the futurist Buck Minister Fuller that you never change reality by fighting the existing system. You do so by creating a new system that makes the old system obsolete. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what these challenger universities and schools are doing is they're creating a new type of system from scratch, which then inspires the current traditional system to look at them and say, hey, you know, you can do this too and mm -hmm. collaborate and push them towards that direction. Yeah. And of course, then there's the need, the real need for continuous learning, because as we know, I mean, the fact that you got a degree, um, you know, one day in your life doesn't mean you're competent forever. So there is the fact that industries are changing, um, whole industries might disappear, people need to re-educate themselves, they need constant upskilling. And how do we measure that? I mean, we mentioned uh, micro-credentials, then of course badges have been around as well. But I mean, what, what's your opinion? What about continuous learning? How do we measure if a person is competent, let's say five, 10, 20 years after he or she got the qualification? So, um, I mean, I, I, one of the ways you can look at that is look at how the workforce currently 
evaluates competence. In fact, I think one of the best examples of assessments, uh, micro assessments, is how a lot of big, for example, consulting firms evaluate their talent pool. They have competency frameworks, they're regularly uh, finding the skills gaps, and a lot of leading organizations are, are doing this well. But I would love to see a world where this boundaries between middle school, high school, university, masters are completely blurred. There are no such things. You just, everything is lifelong learning and everything is around, you know, micro learning and micro credentialing to constantly upscale. Now, I think that some, one thing to, to keep in mind is, you know, there's, there's the, the thing about upscaling, it, it, it has, it's a double-edged sword. On, on one hand, you really can't predict what you need to upscale for. I mean, there's stats that I'm sure most of us have heard between 60 to 80% of the jobs in 2030 don't exist yet, right? So if you're thinking about preparing for that, even in the short term, what do you upskill? So what's more powerful is to focus on really making sure the current generation coming into the workforce has these universal future ready competencies and soft skills, really things like problem solving, innovation, creativity, empathy, because regardless of what the future of work holds, those will be transferable skills that apply to all of those contexts. And I would like to add to what Raya said. I think probably, you know, one of the things we sat back and looked at in Gleek in terms of our assessment is what, are the, what is the single most um, powerful data point we can give a learner? Uh, and for us, it was for them to understand their learning agility. So one of the things we do at Gleek is we allow learners, and very quickly we allow them to signal, I can change my behaviors with learning, and they understand, is it 30 days for me? You know, this, you know the science around it is it can be as quickly as 30 days or as long as eight months. And really, you being able to understand, if I were to ask most of you in the room, how long does it take you to actually learn something and change your behaviors, most people don't know how to answer that question. And it's a very powerful question for you to know and also for the workforce to know because it's not a one size fit all in any upskilling. But knowing that, it allows, it, it's such a powerful currency for you to have. Um, uh, so, you know, I, I would add to that in terms of this lifelong learning, um, you know, I mean, sometimes we forget like this lifelong learning, we're just living longer and looking younger and, you know, just way more active, right? And that's a good thing, I think, for the women, um, for the guys too, I guess. Um, but, you know, the, the ability to know, I, I think when you asked the question, there was one word you said that kind of threw me off is like, uh, uh, how do you know the skills of your credentials is still valid? A credential or any document given to you should not be static. It should be fluid. There should not be that I got a degree from Stanford or Harvard, it means for the rest of my life, because you know, we are influenced by our experiences. There are moments when we are going to be high in leadership and lower in leadership, high in critical thinking, lower in crit and the, the ability to fluidly signal where we are. That's the beauty of being human beings. Um, I think is what is missing. And if we can signal that, other than, you know, I, uh, 10 years ago or 15 years ago, I went to Harvard or whatever that might be, I think that is where this space should be. Hmm. So it's very much about preparing the mindset and the learning skills and really boosting people to, let's say, go out of their comfort zone to keep you on your toes in terms of looking out and being proactive about your learning to develop yourself. It's not about the paper, it's about you really mm -hmm. and what you're competent at. But traditionally still, it's been the fact that you went to Harvard or Stanford or wherever, you got the diploma, you posted it on your wall, it's there, it looks grand and that's brought stability. But so we're sort of saying that that's not the case anymore. How do you see the landscape changing in, let's say, two years, five years, or even 10 years? Will something radically change now? I think we are already seeing progress. I mean, we talked about some of these challenger universities that are already you know, coming out. So another example, in addition to Minerva, is the London Interdisciplinary School based mm -hmm. out of uh, the U London, UK, uh, you know, where we partner with them. And what they've done is they've created a university degree and under bachelors of arts and, and sciences where it's completely interdisciplinary. 
You learn by solving local and global challenges. You make connections between different disciplines through the lens of challenges, and you earn a fully accredited bachelor's degree in the process. And you know they had an amazing founding cohort just launched, and they're growing every year. And there's another example of Tamara University based out of Berlin that's taking a similar approach with undergraduate degrees in sustainability, big data and tech. It's completely hybrid, project-based, skill-based, and so on. So you're starting to see these examples. I think in the next two Two years, we're going to see more and more of these challenger universities and high schools. And I think that's where most of the innovation will happen. Uh, what I hope will happen beyond that is you start to see entire system, systemic change led by governments with, who will hopefully completely reimagine and revamp education policy, education regulations, so that these alternative challenger systems become mainstream. So, uh, or, you know, Finland is leading the way here. You have certain states in the United States that are leading the way, but really every country in the world should have a competency-based, outcome-based curriculum that is informed by the future of work um, with schools that offer personalized learning pathways and recognize alternative transcripts. And all of these things should be explicitly um, led by policy and regulation. And hopefully that becomes the mainstream model of education for the future. So really the big challenges are on the system level. What do you think, Salian? I mean, how can we attack that problem? What will happen in 10 years or two years? Do we have to wait a long time or are we on the verge of actual change? So I'm not a big believer and maybe it's because I come from a uh, developing country that um, uh, and very different, I would say from uh, uh, the UAE. Um, where we depend on government or systems to actually change anything. Um, I think um, because corporates have decided that they play a role in education and they are an active stakeholder mm -hmm. in education, that's where the actual change will come. Because the reality is, is all, all of us are educating. It doesn't matter on what level. Why are we educating? You know, what is the outcome and impact. Not the output, I got the degree, because the credential and the assessment is just the output. Sure. What is the real outcome and impact of education? It is to produce overall, um, you know, thriving human beings who can go out there and not only provide for themselves, but provide to the world in whatever way they yeah. would like. And that means the ultimate stakeholder are going to be the entrepreneurs, big corporate, and I think because they have now stepped in um, as a valid stakeholder, um, they are the top down. I don't think it's government. I think, you know, as I said, in some forward thinking countries like the UAE, uh, we might have government step in. But I think in most places in the world, government will not step in. Um, uh, and, you know, the reality is, is that educational institutions continue to be profitable and um, uh, parents are probably um, the worst stakeholders to actually shift <laughs> parents and teachers and I say this as a teacher <laughs> myself are probably the, the you know the ones who are gonna battle you tooth and nail for any kind of change right. and that's okay yeah. that's okay um, so it is gonna happen but it's not gonna happen for me because of government or because of educators it's going to happen because of corporates Thank you. Let's turn to our audience now. Um, what do you think? What's your experience? What needs to change? What has already changed? Do we have a mic somewhere? Uh, yeah. And before the audience starts, for anyone who finds whatever that was said interesting in terms of assessments, whatever, I have a QR code for Dubai Cares um, and Rewired where you can access actually all of the Gleek for your companies, your schools for three months. Um, so please take advantage of it in terms of how we are assessing soft skills, opening it up to your group. I wanted to make sure I told you guys that so you take advantage of it. Perfect. Thank you for sharing. Um, do we have questions, comments? There's a question or I comment have a mic here. here. Hi, I'm Alison Burroughs. I'm uh, head of education at Middlesex University in Dubai. 
and uh, most of my work is in training masters of education students who will be working in our ministry and private school classrooms in the UAE. And I really wanted to shift the conversation to neuroeducation um, because as we talk about transforming pedagogy and assessment, um, I don't see the principles of neuroeducation being embedded into university curriculums or into professional development microlearning credentials inside of schools. And the information we have now about how the brain learns is very powerful and it can be very applicable, especially to children. And I also think we can leverage technology to follow the neuroeducation um, facts rather than use technology in, in a meaningless way for its own sake inside of the classroom. So I'm just wondering your thoughts on neuroeducation and how this can align to pedagogy and assessment in K-12 environments particularly. Sure. So luckily, I have a degree in neuroscience, so I can try <laughs> to tackle that question. Um, so I, I couldn't agree more. I think one of the one of my favorite descriptions of teachers by a pioneer of neuroeducation called David D'Souza, he describes teachers as brain changers because every day they're changing brains. So it's crazy to think that most um, uh, teaching curriculums or education you know, trained schools don't actually teach teachers about the science of the brain and the science of learning, given that that's what they're doing, whether they realize it or not. So um, I think that if you even look at, you know, there's some things that we innately know about how we ought to teach that is now being proven empirically through evidence. So for example, we actually know that brains learn best in social environments. They, we learn best as social creatures, which now we gives a scientific proof not just for social learning, but group assessments, collaborative assessments, like some people genuinely assess better in that kind of a context. We also know that we are most likely uh, to perform well in chunks, right? So the fact that we do one summative assessment clashes with what we know about the brain performing well in chunk-based learning and potentially, you know, micro assessments. But I think what's really exciting about the neuroeducation trend is that we used, you know, we used to treat education as an art, and to some extent it is still an art, but now it's more of a science. We can apply the scientific method to actually evaluate different and compare different approaches to teaching and see empirically which ones do well and use them to inform how we train teachers and how we shape policy. So I think it's yeah, absolutely vital. And I think everything we've said about what assessments should be aligns beautifully with what we know about the brain. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments? Come on, this side. There we go. <laughs> Hi, my name is Saha Tutunji. I'm the uh, <clears throat> academic director of an NGO in Lebanon. We work with Syrian refugees. And all that you're saying is fine and well, but we, just like the panel before, we are forgetting that there is a lot of inequality in education and it has really come up with the COVID-19 and technology when most of the children, like there's more than 258 million students who are refugees or are not learning in schools, conventional schools. We forget about them. Tools that they don't have, like the computers, laptops, access to internet, um, and even the assessment when they do come to schools and then they are assessed to go, we send them back to school once we, we prepare them to join the mainstream schools. And they assess them just like they assess any other child, which is not fair. In our case, it's Maslow, not Bloom. So is any, you know, has any studies come up to look at this aspect? Children, vulnerable children, children who are marginalized, they're forgotten, that's one. And second, what about children who have learning challenges? Assessing those has to be different, has to have a different context because they can excel in their areas. And we've all, we've been hearing about the regular mainstream assessment technology no one has spoken about the vulnerable, the, ch the, one, the students who are also facing challenges. Well, I have to, if I can address that quickly, um, I have to say that uh, my daughter actually has um, great challenges in learning. I and had, I, me too, I was a challenge. And technology has actually um, supported her 
So the fact that you have different means of learning, for instance, she has um, fairly severe dyslexia. We, we lost you. Can, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, now it's better. So my daughter has fairly severe dyslexia and the fact that um, she's been able to have her books as audio books has helped her a lot. So again, their technology can support you. And also um, what we've, like in Finnish vocational education and training, about 30 to 50% of the students in a specific class have some sort of learning disabilities or let's say dyslexia can be sort of on on the uh, one scale, the end of the scale, but um, there are kids with ADHD, there are kids with social, mental, etc. issues. And the fact that we've, let's say, transformed to a learning outcomes based system makes it easier on them as well because you can do it bit and bit at a time. It's not one exam you sit. So also it's about how you look at assessment and how you break the system into chunks that kids can actually learn and live with. So it's not a high pressure situation. Um, something else that we'd like to share about special needs perhaps. So I can share what um, in the adult context, and you know it can very much be applied. Um, there are so many tech, uh, edutech startups that are low tech that is being delivered on SMS and WhatsApp. Uh, we do. I can tell you that most of our uh, learning in certain continents is off WhatsApp. Um, what we, you know, one of the projects we ran last year was a really simple one in the adult space can be applied in the student spaces. You know, we asked a simple problem statement. What if a refugee qualifies for the job of a CEO? How do you know? And what we did is we did an API plugin. This is where you plug in your technology to the monster um, job portal. And we allowed, uh, you know, in the transient refugee population where they could answer on SMS or WhatsApp the cases of where you were looking for certain type of human skills. Because a CEO is majorly, you know, a majority of it is, it might be critical thinking, judgment and decision making, depending on what sector. But we wanted to be able to look at the quality of thought of applying um, and to be able to allow them to signal on a job board, because most traditional job boards, if you look at LinkedIn or, um, you know, Bait or any, they are tagging on very, very traditional, um, you had so much experience, this is what your education showed, and it was not allowing you to see that quality of thought and competency in human skills, um, that, you know, you don't, you, you don't need a certificate in decision making to be a stellar decision maker. Um, so we found alternative ways to be able to have people we would normally not, um, uh, they would not be seen um, in the adult world to give them ways to signal and consistently, so not a one-off, because I think one and done does not do it for this population. You want to be able to see um, uh, this consistent. We did in these five minute increments. So also, you know, taking into consideration attention span, you're on the move all the time. You know, we really design something around that for the adults, for them to be seen. So I think that same type of uh, thought process can be applied within a youth context. Unfortunately, we're running out of time. So I'd like to thank our audience and our speakers for the session and the change continues. We're not there yet, but I think we're taking steps in the right direction. So thank you very much for the session and um, let's continue the conversation. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you guys. Thank, thank you, you so much.